Hi, I'm Marge Charmley and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Plus Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. We have now uh, been past our 20th year of being filming and being on the air, and we are entering into our 21st year here at the Regional Conference on Bisexuality called Because, which is celebrating its 30th year of being in existence. So we're thrilled to be here at the Wellstone Center in the west side of St. Paul, and we are interviewing people from across the country who are here to celebrate bisexuality, be a part of the community, and be a part of all that we do. So my guest now, oh, and by the way, uh, Anita Kozen, who's the co-host, uh, isn't able to be here at this filming, but will be with us in future filmings. So um, we will await her return when she comes. So our next guest, see one of my fun jobs is I get to meet people from all over and new people, but I've met our next guest before, Jesse Miller. And I'm gonna read this because Jesse is the founder of an organization called BRAVE. And BRAVE is an acronym for Bisexual Plus Resilience Alliance for Violence Eradication. Big job, big job. <laughs> so Jesse, thank you very much for being with us. And I understand that you once lived in the Bi Cities. I did, I did. For and you didn't like it so much. I did not. You did not, so you went back to Chicago. And so you had to be dragged kicking and screaming back here, but you're here and we're glad. Okay, all right, okay. So Jesse, tell us about Brave you know, it, it, uh, how it got started, what you're doing, everything you want us to know about BRAVE. Yeah, oh wow, there's so much to say. Um, so I came up with the idea for BRAVE um, a couple of years ago because so um, I was the president of Bisexual Queer Alliance Chicago, okay. um, which is another bi plus nonprofit, um, but based in Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. lovingly and affectionately called Be Quack. Be Quack, okay. Scott Chabot. All right. Um, and so I was the president of that for three years. And, you know, before that, I was on the board of Bob. And so I'd really been in the Bi Plus nonprofit space for a really long time. And I was kind of looking for my next passion project. And so, you know, I was really just thinking, I was like, okay, I was like, what do I want to dedicate the next few years of my life to? Wow. And the biggest thing that I kept thinking about and what I kind of always think about, especially because I am a sociologist and I'm getting my PhD in sociology. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always thinking about like, what are structural, what are the structural forces at B that are um, directly impacting us as human beings and how can we change those structures at B? And so I was thinking about the groups that have been, um, really ignored and neglected by various types of institutions. And obviously the first community that came to my mind was the Bi Plus community. Yes. Um, especially like as someone who like very proudly identifies as bi and yeah. has for well over a decade, um, you know, I wanted to do something that of course gave back to my community. And, you know, again, as a sociologist and as a researcher, something I was thinking about is the fact that there's very little research done on the bi plus community and there's very few structural supports uh, for the bi uh, community. And so I was thinking about, okay, how can I contribute? How can I start changing some of the life circumstances of my fellow bi plus people? And something that has always really appalled me is the insanely high rates of domestic and intimate partner violence within the bi plus community. Um, for those of you who might not know, um, over 66% of bi plus women have experienced intimate partner violence. Um, and I believe it's 34% of bi plus men have experienced intimate partner violence. And that is way larger compared to their gay, lesbian, and heterosexual peers. And that's from the CDC, yes. Center for Disease Control. So this is a governmental body that is yes. generating that data. Yeah, yeah, and it's also been found in other reports. So I believe that was from um, a CDC report in 2000, 2013, 2016, don't exactly quote me. Um, 
But there is also the um, map project that was completed in 2016, which was about um, the invisible majority, the bi plus community. Okay. And that also confirmed a lot of these same findings. And yeah. many studies have confirmed over and over again that the bi plus community has extremely high rates of intimate partner violence. Unfortunately, like I said, there is very little research on the bi plus community in general. And so we're like slowly working our way there. I do a lot of bi plus research, particularly with Dr. Lauren Beach, who yes. I'm sure you're very... Oh, she's been on our show many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I am yeah. sure she has. A rock star. We call her a rock star in yeah. these parts. Yeah, 100%. It's, yeah. You know, I've been doing like a lot of research in this arena with, um, with Lauren for the past few years now. Through her university affiliation? Yeah, and okay. I also have my own university affiliation. Okay, um, all right. Because I'm a graduate student at the University of Illinois Chicago. Okay. Um, so I'm getting my PhD there, and then I um, work on a lot of the same research projects with Lauren. But I actually got involved in research with Lauren um, when I was doing stuff with BeQuack because we wanted to improve the primary care experiences of bi plus. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's kind of that was kind of like my first step into the research. But again, in general, there is so little research done on the bi plus population. And even though we know that there are these very high rates and we're just kind of starting to get at why, we're still not fully sure. So, the, you know, the main two things that we have kind of found in the limited research that we have is um, biphobia is okay. one of the absolute biggest issues um, and the biggest reasons that um, bi plus people face like the highest rates of violence. And the other big thing is that there are no specific supports um, in the entire country for bi plus survivors of domestic violence. It wow. does not exist. Um, I think the only group that I have found internationally doing this kind of work is in London, wow. I believe. And that was the only org I could find in the entire world, uh, which I think really says something. And the thing is, is that, you know, the needs of bi plus survivors of intimate partner violence are unique. And so they're not being treated at the traditional straight domestic violence providers their needs are ignored. What is happening is ignored and neglected. They're not getting at the full like root of the problem, right? And then they go to the anti-violence programs at like um, various LGBT organizations and they tend to only serve the G and the L. Okay. And so again, bi plus needs and bi plus people are ignored. Um, and oftentimes when they go to either of these spaces, they're also experiencing a lot of bi plus. So imagine that you're someone who is experiencing intimate partner violence or domestic violence. And so you're trying to get help. You go to the traditional straight domestic violence provider, you face biphobic stereotypes, comments, which are violence, which are microaggressions, right? And you've already experienced violence and you're mm -hmm. experiencing it again. And then you're like, okay, let me go to the gay anti-violence programs. And then you're experiencing it again. On that end, you're, yeah. So I, you know, again, like we don't fully know the causes, and we're still doing research on it, but the two biggest things that I would point to are biphobia and the fact that the institutions and resources that we have currently to serve domestic violence survivors do not serve the bi plus community. How are our needs different? Can you talk a little bit about what the other agencies are missing? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, that's a great question, actually. So one, I think bi plus needs are different just in the fact that people need to actually understand and affirm uh, like bi plus identities. Like it, that it exists, yeah, exactly. it exists, like, yeah, we, we are here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and like not only just like acknowledge that we exist, but also like affirm that, create yes. a positive space, right? yes. welcoming for that. Yes. You know, it's so, like, that's like very bare minimum. Like, yeah, like low bar, right? Low yeah, bar. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the unique needs, but honestly, otherwise in terms of unique needs, I wouldn't necessarily say that some of it's even completely specific to the bi plus community, but it's something that these domestic violence providers are missing in general. And so those are things like, um, you'll find a lot in domestic violence spaces that there's a lot of like perpetrator and victim. Mm, okay. We don't really use that language oh, at Brave. Okay. And we do that on purpose because of the fact that oftentimes in these types of situations, it's not a clear line. It is not a clear distinction between who's a perpetrator and a victim. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is like, don't get me wrong, right, like right, those yeah, yeah. exist, but a lot of times it doesn't. And to be quite honest, even if we are to use the language of perpetrator and victim, perpetrators also need help, or they are also going to continue perpetrating violence. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is that, like, you know, we're currently trying to raise funds to start a virtual support group for survivors, 
but we also want to work with what the traditional DV community would call perpetrators mm -hmm. because we don't believe that that binary is completely accurate of most people's situations. And oftentimes, you know, when you have been victimized and you are in those sorts of situations, um, you know, a lot of times um, people do end up acting out in violent ways. And so again, like that type of line, that boundary gets really blurred. What words do you use, if not victim and perpetrator? What is the parlance that you use? We usually just use survivor. Survivor, okay. Yeah, all that's right. what we usually say, survivor or someone who is experienced, like the okay. survivor. Okay, all right. Um, those are typically the words that we use. But yeah, we really, um, yeah, we really try to stay away from perpetrator and victim because again, like what the traditional DV providers would call the perpetrators, those are also people who need our help. Okay. And in some ways, like, I hate to put it this way, in some ways they need our help more um, because of the fact that they are the ones that are perpetrating more of the violence. They are the ones that need more of the support mm -hmm. and aren't getting it. Okay. And it's also, too, you know, something that we really think about at Brave is that we kind of also, even though a lot of our work is really focused on domestic violence and intimate partner violence, we also have a broader definition of violence. So when we think about violence, we also think about structural violence. We also think about oppressive violence. Mm -hmm. um because the fact of the matter is too is that you know a lot of times in dv situations you know uh folks that are involved in these situations are also experiencing like structural violence mm -hmm. and oppression and the fact of the matter is that like we at brave even though a lot of our work is tackling like dv and ipv we want to also be tackling those larger structures and and give a definition of structural violence for People yeah. who might be wondering about that in the audience. No, very, very fair. So when I think of structural violence, I think the violence that is enacted by institutions. So okay. things like the violence that um, hospitals might enact on their patients because they are racist or biphobic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or the violence that governments um, can perpetrate against um, you know, the people living beneath them, um, whether that's through like structural and systematic racism, um, biphobia, homophobia, um, ableism, et cetera. So typically when I think of structural violence, I'm really thinking of like those larger social structures. So like schools, governments, okay, institutions, churches, institutions okay. um, that like essentially just, you know, further create and continue the violence of like different types of policies that can really hurt communities like ours. So if I were a survivor, and I came to you, what services might I expect from Brave? Yeah, so here's the thing. So Brave is still very much like on the ground floor of our plan. Oh, we are embryonic, are we? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, you know, a little over a year and a half, but a lot of that time we really spent, we're trying to do things differently than okay. um, the traditional domestic violence providers. Okay. For example, one of our big things, like I already mentioned, is that we don't really believe in the perpetrator victim violence. Okay. But it's also more than that. We also refuse to work with the police, oh, um, okay. which often taking various types of domestic violence grants, you are forced to work with the police. Oh, okay. We will not be doing that okay. um, because oftentimes, especially, you know, most bi plus people are people of color and most bi plus people have also been victimized by the police. And so mm, okay. that is a very unsafe resource mm -hmm. um, for folks. And also oftentimes, even if the police are called and they show up, they don't necessarily improve the situation. They often escalate the situation. And so those are just a couple of like minor ways in which we're really trying to do things differently. We also have a radical, um, like a uh, radical justice model. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really important to us. So if someone commits a harm, um, we don't just like kick that person out and like not do anything. We really believe in finding ways to still incorporate that person and to really address the harm that was caused. Because the thing is, is that by just kicking people out, they further become isolated mm -hmm. and more prone to committing violence. And so we really need to have models of inclusion that support everyone, even if they have committed violence. Is there any kind of reparations that are built into your model? Exactly. Whatever I mean, that might look like, exactly. yeah. Um, you know, a lot of like um, radical justice type spaces are about is, you know, kind of working in that community setting and figuring out what those are. How can that person make up for that harm? How can they resolve it? You know, it definitely still holds that person 
accountable, you know, they do still need to take certain steps and, you know, do certain things, like, for sure. Um, but it still, like, includes them in that process and doesn't just immediately, like, excommunicate them, well, so to speak. So if, again, I were a survivor and I came to you and you, you have a different model, you wouldn't get the police involved, you would address all kinds of you know, discrimination, if you will, or ways that people are harmed. What, what would you come to the hospital with me, or, or, or what could I look for from Brave? Yeah, no, great question. Um, so, you know, like I said, we're on the ground floor. Okay. We've got the values, we've got a lot of those in place, but what we're okay. currently trying to do is because we don't really have any space. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. We're trying to start the first ever virtual support group. Okay, all right. So by Plus Survivors of Domestic Violence. Okay, so you're looking for some grants for that or some money. So we're currently... You, you wanted me to ask about money, I think. Yes, so. no, okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so we are currently, um, we are likely going to be incorporating as a nonprofit very soon. Um, we're probably going to make the final decision on that literally in the next uh -huh, month. Uh -huh. So maybe by the time folks watch this at home, uh, we'll be a nonprofit. Fingers crossed. All right, there we go. Yeah, yeah, See? yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, after that step is kind of completed, then we can really start applying for grants. And so we actually want to apply for a grant through the Visibility Impact Fund. Okay. Um, since it's extremely hard for BIPLUS organizations to receive any sort of LGBT funding. I won't go into that because I'm sure Neil already covered it. Um, yeah. But, you know, since BIPLUS orgs are very unlikely to receive, like, LGBT grants, we definitely want to apply for grants from the Visibility Impact yeah. But currently, uh, we can't apply for funds to the Visibility Impact Fund because we are not a nonprofit okay. um, and we don't have a fiscal sponsor. Okay, gotcha. And so um, we're hoping that after, you know, we incorporate that there's a lot more doors open for us. But yeah, our goal is really in the next one to two years to get this virtual support group up and running. Um, this first support group is only going to be available to Chicagoland residents. Okay. Um, but we're hoping that if this one goes well, that we can then expand to different cities across the globe. And even though it's virtual, you're probably wondering like, oh, like why can't anyone from across the country attend? It gets very complicated with confidentiality and mandatory reporting. Yeah, so who will this be led by? Will this be led by a professional or is it a peer group? And yeah, because I, I, as you may know, I work as a psychologist and interjurisdictional across state it's very complicated. Telehealth is very complicated. Yeah, because yeah, if somebody's in trouble, do you know the resources, like emergency resources, hospitals, whatever it is that people might need? Yeah. So we're planning as run, on running it as a peer support group so that um, we don't have to abide by mandatory reporting laws. So uh -huh. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. Folks. Okay. But there will always be a professional in the room facilitating. Okay. Um, and we're really doing that as a safeguard for folks. Um, and, you know, we could just have it be entirely peer led and that would still be totally valid. But especially since five plus survivors just have so few resources, we really want to make sure that like a licensed social worker is like in that room mm -hmm. um, and able to help get us through the sticky moments and recommend resources and and do the things to really help all of us. So that is awesome. Yeah. And we also plan on paying that person, which is part of the reason why we uh, are raising the money yes. to do the virtual support group. Yeah. What haven't we talked about that you want to make sure our audience knows about? Uh, well, since we are trying to raise the money, um, we can currently only um, accept cash donations. We're, we are working on getting other ways, but again, complicated legalities when you're not like oh yeah. Not yeah, yeah 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 it, it gets very complicated but we do have social media okay and you can always follow us on there and also see what kinds of events we're going to um to perhaps drop off some cash donations or to buy a beautiful pin like this one on my lovely jacket here that says brave and it's very pretty colored with the bi colors and it's got like our logo so you are here at because you're presenting and you're doing this and you also have a table yes and so that's a place where people here at the conference could go to 
help with your fundraising. Yes, exactly. By the time this airs, of course, it'll be too late, but maybe next year, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying, like, especially, like, if folks, like, are able to follow us on social media, you know, they can see where we're headed. And I'm sure that after, you know, we incorporate, which I think is, like, very likely. Um, then we can actually start, you know, taking money and donations online. Um, and that will be a much more streamlined process. And then folks don't even have to come see us in person. I mean, please come see us in person. But if you can't, that's yeah, 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 yeah. And our social media, um, we are on um, mainly just Instagram and Facebook. But um, if folks just search bravely.by, so bravely, B-R-A-V-E-L-Y dot B-I, um, you'll find us on uh, Facebook and Instagram um, and so we have um, we are in, even though I am the founder of Brave we again in the tradition of not doing things the same way as others do uh -huh. we're actually a non-hierarchical leadership structure uh -huh. so I'm the founder in the sense that like I came up with the idea yes. but that's really it otherwise we have what we call um, so instead of calling it a steering committee uh -huh. we call it a clearing Committee. A querying committee, okay. Um, and so um, my best friend um, who is on the querying committee with me, um, like designed like these postcards yeah, and yeah. designed our logo and like runs all of our social media. So our social media game is uh, quite nice. Yeah. Uh, thanks to Jordan, um, who actually, funny enough, also presented at this conference today. All right. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, you know, like I said, we're on the ground floor. We're really trying to get things started. And it's taken us a while to get to where we are because we really had to kind of rethink and reinvent the wheel in a lot of ways in terms yeah. of what we wanted to do. And so that took quite a bit of time. But if folks are interested in getting involved with Brave, um, follow us on social media. And we actually have a link tree. Um, on our social media where you can sign up for our newsletters. Mm -hmm. So we basically send out emails, I think like twice a month, um, because we have um, virtual meetings monthly. Um, they're Mondays from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Um, anyone can come, contribute ideas. You don't have to be a member of the querying committee uh -huh. um, to contribute. And we always love having new people. Even though our, our first virtual support group will be based in the Chicagoland area because that's where most of us are based, uh -huh. this organization is national. Okay. Um, and so folks across the country can come. We actually even had someone from New Zealand come to one of our meetings all right. time. Yeah. Um, just in the middle of the meeting. night for them, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I think it was like very early. Uh, okay. Basically something. That's middle of the night for me, but you know, <laughs> for those of us who are... But, you know, folks from across the country can come join in on the meetings, give their opinions. And if they want to do more, they can join the querying committee. Um, and basically the querying committee is we basically just operate like a working board, mm -hmm. which is essentially like, you know, how the working boards of like bisexual organizing project operate or how bisexual queer alliance Chicago operate, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So being on the querying committee is really just like a commitment to like actually helping us do the work. Yeah. Um, but even if, you know, you just had a couple of hours to spare once a month and want to give your input on things, we're always welcome for that. And even if you can't get involved and you just want to share our posts on social media sometimes or donate to us or go to a conference and come see us, we appreciate anything because the work that we're doing, like I said, it really is kind of the first of its kind um, in the country, um, second of its kind in the entire world that I know of. And so this work is so unbelievably important because no one wants to call, um, you know, what's happening the bi-plus community an epidemic, but I personally consider it an epidemic because yeah. I think it is absolutely unacceptable that two thirds of bi-plus women have experienced intimate partner violence. Yeah. That is way too high. I mean, truly anything above 0% is too yeah, high, yeah, yeah. but 66% is way, way, way too high. And so I really just, you know, I came up with this idea for Brave because I really just wanted to finally start doing something about it. Jesse Miller, we're coming down the home stretch. I want to thank you for all that you do for the BiPlus community and for launching Brave, a much needed service for people who have been harmed by this. So we want to wish you all the best as you move forward Thanks. and look forward to hearing about your successes down the road. Would you please <laughs> join us in our signature goodbye? Yes, absolutely. Bye for now.
Ponte la bola! 